chapter 17, following uh, Paul and Silas on their second missionary journey, and the title of the message is effectively uh, sharing the gospel. Basically, uh, through Luke's uh, narrative, we're kind of able to some degree get in the, the hip pocket of the Apostle Paul uh, and uh, hear messages, at least a condensed version, uh, see how he goes about very effectively uh, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and leading uh, uh, men and women and children of faith uh, in, uh, in the Lord. And uh, since that's our primary mission in life, uh, certainly want to take advantage of that as we look at these studies. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, Paul does, and again, he's leaving, uh, leaving Philippi. Uh, there's been a church established there in the home of Lydia. Uh, remember, he uh, got arrested. He and Silas got beaten uh, uh, with rods thrown into a prison. Uh, and then God brings an earthquake as Paul and Silas are praying about midnight. Uh, and the, and the uh, Philippian jailer, his family end up getting saved. Uh, Paul then uh, notifies them that he's a Roman citizen, which puts a lot of fear and trembling into those magistrates because they could be executed. For, uh, for beating and imprisoning a Roman citizen without a trial. Uh, so they kind of roll out the red carpet to, uh, to Uncle Paul and uh, as he strolls on over to Lydia's house just to identify her with him and these new believers. So they've got a lot of favor there in Philippi that nobody's going to kind of be messing with them. Uh, Paul moves on now to get to uh, Thessalonica, which is uh, a major seaport town, uh, uh, lots of uh, interstate freeways came through that crossroads came through there. Uh, it is the capital of uh, Macedonia. Uh, again, that's the Roman name. We'd say Northern Greece uh, today. Uh, I got a couple of uh, shots of uh, uh, just to kind of I think kind of helps to kind of see these places. So some of the ruins of, of one of the walls uh, leading down to the city, big city today. Probably 20,000 in Paul's day, which was considered a pretty good sized city in the ancient world. Uh, big city today. Uh, and you can go on to the next one. Uh, we'll talk about the marketplace. Uh, there's going to be a little, a little crowd uh, uh, raised up in the marketplace to come against uh, Paul. Uh, this is the ruins of that actual uh, marketplace. Lots of uh, ruins of the Roman world. And then uh, some of the ancient walls, uh, very foreboding there, uh, of the ancient city of Thessalonica. So uh, Paul's on his way there. One of the other things, as we were able to do with uh, Philippi is to be able to read, read the letter or portions of the letter and uh, get a sense of Paul writing back to them. Uh, and we'll see uh, in this section that Paul is going to be here for a period of time and not be able to go back again. Uh, because of that, he writes a letter to them very quickly, 1 Thessalonians, uh, and he'll say this to this uh, group of believers, newly established church, 1 Thessalonians 1.5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit in much assurance, as you know, what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy uh, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so again, uh, effective evangelism. We're just gonna, we're gonna go through some principles here that are found uh, in that verse I just read and in our text. Uh, and here we see already Paul makes reference to what kind of men we were, and you became followers of us. That means they were the real deal, and, uh, and people saw it and knew it. The Apostle Paul was doing his tent-making, mending. Uh, he, received, he was there for a period of time. We're going to read about the three Shabbats or Sabbaths. He was there, but obviously he's there much longer, long enough for the church in Philippi to understand what he's doing, take up an offering and send it to him. Take up an offering and send it to him to help him support in the ministry. That occurs on two different uh, occasions. But he, but he led a life uh, as an example of Jesus Christ. And we're never going to be really effective in sharing the gospel. I mean, it is possible to share the gospel with somebody that doesn't know you from Adam and they come to faith in Christ. But for the most part, people are going to come to the Lord. Uh, the people you know that you have influence with and they're going to be watching your, your lives. So uh, that's certainly uh, important. Secondly, we notice it's in much affliction. Uh, and if you, if you read both of those letters, he'll make reference to that. Uh, and the same is for us. It's not always easy sharing the gospel. Uh, doing the work of, uh, of an evangelist. Sometimes it will be with much affliction or a lot of problems or a lot of hassle or a lot of pushback from people. Not everybody is uh, receptive. Uh, we're going to see that's indicative of Paul's ministry. And yet, 
man, the guy was uh, maybe the greatest evangelist that's, uh, uh, that's ever lived. Uh, but two principles that we can see already, uh, and there's some important ones in uh, this opening uh, paragraph as well. Uh, and that's why we've entitled it The Apologetics of Paul in Thessalonica. Uh, verse 1 to 4 says, Now when they had passed through uh, Amphipolis and uh, Apol Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of Jews. Then Paul, as was his custom, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. A couple of important words we're going to look at. And that's one of them, verse 3. Explaining and demonstrating, those are the other two, uh, that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul uh, and Silas. So uh, we're saying first that the apologetics is given in a critically uh, important city. So Paul would walk on the Ignatia Way, which is still there today, the remains of it, 100 miles from Philippi to, uh, to Thessalonica. Buses weren't running that day, so they had to, uh, to walk. Probably took a, a few days. Uh, uh, they bypassed uh, two other cities, uh, either because he was dead set on getting to this capital, uh, and that was really his MO, reach people in a big city with the gospel, establish a church and a ministry, let them reach out to the smaller villages uh, around them. It also could be because there wasn't a Jewish synagogue uh, in either of those, uh, those cities. But uh, trying to get to Thessalonica, Again, uh, the only city in ancient Greece that rivaled its size was, uh, was Corinth itself. Predominantly a Greek city, though controlled by Rome, quote, a free city, which means it had uh, elected officials, they minted their own coins, and, uh, and so forth, uh, and he's there for a period of time. I want to go back to 1 Thessalonians again and pick up in verse 6 where we left off. Uh, to mention a few other things about this church and Paul's feeling towards it and to say that, uh, hey, the uh, ministry was effective. It says there, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all of us in Macedonia and Achaia who believed. Uh, for from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, like it's gone out like a trumpet, not only in Macedonia, Macedonia, that Roman province, in Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out so that you do not need to say anything. So, uh, pretty effective ministry. We talk about fruit and fruit that will remain. Uh, these guys have come, uh, men and women, to come to faith in Christ, and uh, they are out sharing their faith with others from this very important city uh, there in northern Greece. Let's, let's get into the uh, uh, the heart of this thing uh, in terms of uh, the apologetics included reasoning with them from the scriptures and we see this in verse 2 then Paul uh, as was his custom went into them uh, and the them of course are, are the Jews uh, the word for custom is the word Greek word ethos um, we might say it was his <laughs> ethic to do it this way that's because <clears throat> the great commission was to take the gospel to the Jews and to the Gentiles also. Paul would state it that way in Romans 1.16 where he'd say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, first for the Jew and also for the Greek or for the Gentiles. So this was his, his ethic. He, uh, this is how he went about what he was doing. Was it just a pattern? Was it just a habit? Uh, it was a frame of mind that this is actually how the gospel was supposed to go out. And that's the way it did go out. Uh, in the first century, started losing that in the second century, and it was gone uh, by the third century. It's kind of only in, in uh, our lifetime, I'm using our in a very general sense, uh, that uh, uh, that has really changed in terms of uh, uh, a ministry and getting the gospel out to the Jewish people. But uh, uh, we praise God that uh, there is a return to the mandate or this ethic uh, once again. Now, in terms of the key words that Paul uses to describe sharing the gospel, the first one uh, is uh, there in verse 2. He reasoned with them from the scripture. Uh, and the, uh, the root word there for reason is where we get our English word dialogue. But it's much more than just having a little conversation. Oh, I'm just talking to this fellow about the Lord over here. It actually is kind of the idea to, to argue. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of references uh, about that and show that to you and then show you how this was kind of Paul's MO. This is 
uh, this is what he did. I think in, in saying and in reading the English word reasoned, uh, I also have to read First, first uh, uh, Peter 3.15. 3, when we read the word reasoned there, that's the word we normally associate with apologia or apologetics. I remember as a pretty much a, a brand new Christian, uh, being in Southern California, driving along uh, with my, uh, my brother, and we went by a, a, a church, a fairly large church, and it had a billboard that, uh, uh, that said Dr. Walter Martin would be uh, speaking there that weekend. Of course, I had no idea who he was at the time. Uh, and, uh, uh, and he would be uh, uh, doing a seminar in apologetics. I had no idea what the word meant, so I asked my brother, what do we have to apologize for as Christians? And he explained to me that, well, it's not that kind of an apology. It means to learn to give reasons uh, for our faith. Evangelical Christians are a target audience for a particular group of religious people. They're called Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. They love evangelical Christians because predominantly they have some basic belief system about God. They believe the Bible is the word of God. They believe Jesus died for their sins. Some of them believe they have a personal relationship with him, uh, but very few of them uh, do not know why they believe what they believe. And so it's easy to question them in their basic belief systems because they just don't have answers. And, uh, and we thank the Lord for kind of pioneers in this field like, uh, like Dr. Martin uh, and, uh, and others. Uh, and we do need to study and have reasons for people. Uh, and we've got good reasons. That's, uh, that's the, the great thing uh, to be able to share with others. And that's important. But what Paul is doing here in the word reason, uh, he's dialoguing. He's willing to even argue if it takes so uh, to get his point across. Uh, and we see the same word, for example, used in Mark 9.34. This is when the disciples were having their ongoing conversation as to who is the greatest? I don't know if you have a, a, lot, a group of friends that you, you talk about that a lot. Who's the greatest among you? But uh, these are the disciples of, of Jesus. And, uh, uh, and they weren't in the sixth grade either uh, at the time of this argument. So, uh, it says in Mark 9, 34. But they kept silent. And, uh, for on the road they had disputed. That's our word for reason. Disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. I don't think they're having a little dialogue there when it says, and they dispute it. So uh, there's some force behind the words uh, is the idea. I mentioned this is Paul's pattern. Let me show you in these other cities. In, uh, in Acts 17, 17, if you look down a little further in our chapter, he's in Athens. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue, our same word, with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Uh, later in Corinth, chapter 18, verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Later in Ephesus, in verse uh, 8 of chapter 19. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way, before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannius. Uh, so, again, what, one of the reasons that, that, uh, that Gentiles have a trouble sharing their faith with Jewish people is because you need to be able to argue to be able to make your, make your point. Uh, and, uh, and Paul was effective at it. He was effective in sharing the gospel because it meant something to him. I can tell you, this doesn't work with everybody. I mean, some people, you kind of raise your voice, you get argumentative, and they're like, I'm out of here. And, um, uh, and so uh, you have to kind of take the cultural context. But I'd say uh, the application for all of us to be effective in, in sharing the gospel with somebody is that it better mean something to us. Here's a little track, and you know, I don't know if you got time, but if you might get time, you can read it. It really doesn't matter a whole lot, but maybe if you just read it a little bit. It's like, that, that's not exactly Paul's style, you can kind of tell. I think you should read this. Probably going to go to hell the rest of your life, you know. <laughs> maybe the most important thing you'll ever read in your life, right here. I'm telling you, I'm one of the, see, that's Paul. Uh, that, that may not work well for everybody in all situations, but that's Paul. And um, very con confrontational and so forth. Uh, and, I'm, and maybe we need to be sometimes, but I would say the overriding thing that we can take away in terms of the application is 
People can tell if you care. They can tell if you're sincere or not. If it doesn't mean anything to you, it won't mean anything to them. And a little, little persistence involved, involved here too, to not, not give up uh, so, so easily. Uh, but this is part of the reason Paul was so effective. And we're, we're going to look at, uh, man, the outcome of uh, these three weeks of uh, the number of people that came to faith in Christ is actually pretty amazing. Well, that's one of the words. The second word uh, in verse 3, he was explaining. This word means to open up or opening up. It's used of Jesus when he opened the eyes of the blind, when he opened the ears uh, of the deaf. And it's used uh, of uh, a couple of guys walking down the Emmaus Road after the death of Jesus on the cross, very dismayed, very discouraged, very depressed. Uh, and then uh, Jesus comes up to them uh, and begins to have a conversation with them that's recorded in, again, our same writer, Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 31. Then their eyes were opened, that's our word, and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? That's our word, to open up. Uh, Paul was, was uh, would say, sincere uh, about his presentation of the gospel. People could tell he was committed to it. Uh, and what he did is he simply opened the scriptures uh, so they could understand uh, the gospel itself. I would say the Bible is very helpful sometimes in presenting the gospel. And sometimes we have a tendency to shy away because we're in a, a, a culture that doesn't know the Bible. They're not familiar with the Bible. Some people are afraid of the Bible. I've been on airplanes, and I, and I take, take my Bible. These days I take my phone out of my tablet out, and I read. Uh, but there was a day when I would take my, my Bible, a <coughs> pretty good-sized Bible, and uh, I would open it up in front of me, and I, I, I would kind of do this because I want to see the reaction. People get nervous. They would just get, sometimes people have questions. They're like, oh, is that a Bible? And, you know, starts a conversation. Other people, they're like, they like scoot over a little bit. Like they're like afraid of it or whatever. It's, that's that book. Uh, but that book can be very helpful. If we can simply just open it up, explain what it said, explain what it says about, uh, uh, about Jesus and, uh, and about the gospel and the condition of mankind. And Paul was able to do that. He was able to open up of the scriptures. And um, again, we've, we've been through Romans. We've been through the Romans road. Uh, I know all of your, you, you've got all those verses underlined. They're all keyed in your Bible. In the back of your Bible on those, where those blank pages are, and I explain, that's where you write down Romans 3.23, and that takes you, and then you can walk somebody. I know you've all got that down. Uh, so you're able to use the scriptures to, and literally open them up. You don't have to have a... A uh, graduate degree in theology uh, to share the simple gospel, but the Bible helps, uh, and uh, uh, in the scriptures again, uh, God can use them to penetrate the hearts and minds of people. That's what Paul was doing here. Third, he was demonstrating, verse three, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. That word demonstrating means proving. It means to place beside or set before. And what Paul was doing, literally, he was taking the Old Testament scriptures about Jesus, about the coming Messiah, and he was laying them down. And then next to it, he was laying them down next to it, the facts about Jesus Christ. Uh, the, uh, the Bible says that he had to be born in Bethlehem. He, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Uh, the Bible says he had to come out of Egypt. Well, actually, he ended up going. He came out of Egypt. The Bible says he'd be called a Nazarene. Well, actually, he grew up in, uh, in Nazareth. Uh, David said in Psalm 22 uh, that he would be pierced. Actually, Jesus was pierced by the sword uh, and in his hands and in his feet. Uh, Isaiah the prophet says uh, that by his stripes we would be healed. Jesus was actually scourged and literally had stripes. He just went through and laid out the scriptures laid out the facts of Jesus and, and try to help people connect the dots in terms of uh, who Jesus was. Again, Isaiah 53, 5, I'm sure Paul uh, went through this, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Uh, and I, I just want to say, it's easy to kind of take this and say, well, yeah, that applies to somebody that actually believes in the Bible. Like if you were talking to somebody that was Jewish, or maybe even you talked to somebody that grew up in a church or organized religion, maybe they're Roman Catholic or uh, uh, Anglo-Baptarian or something, and uh, they know the Bible a little bit, 
uh, and you can point those scriptures out. Uh, hey, listen, I've done it with people that have never seen a Bible before, and they're fascinated by it. The fact that this book predicted exactly where Jesus would be born, about his growing up, where he would come from, how he would die, how he would live, how he would be resurrected. People are kind of interested in that, uh, actually. It's not just limited to the person that has that kind of background, but if they do, uh, that certainly uh, is, is a plus. Paul just took the scriptures and went, here's what it says, and here's who Jesus is. Guess what? It's not that tough to connect these dots. Uh, he is the Messiah. You know what? You can believe that or you can reject that, but I just want to let you know what the Bible says. You know, a good line to say to people, I hate to have you reject the Bible and you have no idea what it even says. There's a lot of people that rejected the Bible. They have no idea what's even in it. They heard something one time, uh, and that's about it. Uh, and so uh, these are effective ways in sharing the gospel. Uh, and it leads to this. We'd say the apologetics involved an explanation of the gospel, and that's in verse 3. Also, uh, the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you uh, is the Christ. Death and resurrection, it's at the heart of the gospel. You review the sermons given in the book of Acts, and you'll find it there uh, every time. So what was the result of Paul sharing the gospel? Well, that's in verse 4, and it's pretty amazing, actually. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul in silence. I just, I just wanted to point out that phrase, and they were persuaded. Uh, a lot of times uh, people come to faith in Christ uh, for a lot of different reasons uh, because uh, uh, they're having a hard time in life, they're having a hard time in their marriage, they're having a, <laughs> lost their job, whatever the reason, they're kind of in crisis. That wasn't the case, and that's great, that's great. Uh, that wasn't the case. They were actually persuaded. Paul just actually laid things out for them, and you know what? The gospel makes sense. The condition of mankind. Why is there so much evil in the world? It's because of the fall of mankind. Why does God allow these things to happen? If he's a good, loving uh, God, why does he allow this suffering? Well, he's not very long. He's going to judge this world. Uh, and no one will get away with anything. All evil will be punished. The question is, are you part of it? Or have you come to faith in him? We've got great answers for life predicaments and why we're where we are. Uh, we have the, the hope of the message. Yes, this life is difficult uh, and so forth, uh, and death is a scary thing, but we have the hope of Jesus Christ. We're going to be with him for all eternity. We've got, we got a great message uh, to, to give out to people. Uh, and, uh, and if Paul was, again, we're saying Paul, we're say, we should say in the Holy Spirit working through the Apostle Paul, is able to persuade persuade people to come to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, then we should be able to do that uh, uh, as well. Uh, but uh, sometimes it means we've got to live it out before them. Uh, we've got to make sure our walk matches our talk. Uh, we've got to know that we mean what we say, that we're sincere about it, we're a little persistent about it uh, at times, uh, and we're able to use the scriptures uh, to uh, uh, depict Jesus and who he is uh, as the Messiah and the Savior of the world. But again, I, uh, I regress. Let's go on. But the point here is that uh, the outcome. Uh, notice it was a great multitude of devout Greeks. So some Jews from the synagogue got saved. Uh, some of the Gentiles that were there uh, had come to believe that uh, the God of Judaism was the creator God. He was the God of the world. They'd come to understand how to worship him. They hadn't fully entered in, any of them, into Judaism. Uh, and, uh, and they're hearing the gospel. And we'll <laughs> find that uh, these men received Christ uh, in, uh, in large numbers as Paul goes throughout the, uh, uh, through Europe. Uh, but notice this phrase, and a few leading women join Paul and Silas. What did it take to be a leading woman? Oh, you had to have great fashion sense. That's what it was. No, that, that's not what it is at all. Uh, these means, these gals are, are married to Roman officials. Uh, that's, that's what that phrase means. Uh, so, uh, this, after three weeks, he's got a pretty good church, a little church going here. Uh, you got some Jewish folks, you got some Gentile guys, and you've got uh, gals that are married to, uh, to Roman <laughs> officials. Uh, Paul's pretty effective uh, in sharing the, the gospel. Uh, and again, uh, we in our day and age, 
Uh, we sometimes, in our apologetics and sharing with people, uh, can't even begin with the person of Jesus Christ. We have to actually begin with, did the universe have a beginning? If it did, then the beginner is God. He is the first cause. If he caused it all, is he noble? Yes, he's noble. We have to kind of work our way down the line even to get to Jesus, especially with younger people. Uh, there's just a lot of people, though, you don't have to know any of that stuff. They just, they just pretty much want to know the Lord. And it's just the simple gospel that brings them to faith uh, in Christ. But it doesn't hurt us to study a little bit. It doesn't hurt us to have a couple of <laughs> tracks uh, about those kinds of things. Uh, we've got a little Josh McDowell book, a little Bible New Testament paperback. It's got the apologetics in it. You can just kind of open it up and read it and go here. Consider this and the claims of Christ. Got any questions? Call Pastor Tim. No, let me know. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, a really good answer to people's questions is, I don't know. If you can get used to that, uh, you can share with a lot of people. I don't know is a good answer. But it's, I don't know, but I'm going to find out and get back to you. If, you. if you think you have to know it all before you start sharing your faith, uh, that's probably not going to happen. So just get used to that. Hey, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, and I don't know that. You know who will grow right along with them? You will. <laughs> because uh, you're going to have to find out those answers and then go back to that friend or family member uh, with uh, uh, the facts uh, concerning Jesus Christ uh, and God's word. Well, this leads to an assault on Jason's house, verses 5 to 9. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring him out to the people. But when they did not find them, Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar saying there's another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city uh, when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So the motive certainly is clear. It's uh, envy. It's envious. Uh, there's uh, a lot of people that have left now the synagogue. Uh, there are uh, those uh, Jews that were Jewish men that were part of the synagogue that have left, put their faith in Jesus uh, as the Messiah. And, um, and so these guys are upset about it. So they go into the marketplace where they can kind of stir up a crowd and be a lot of people uh, there. Again, the, the ruins, uh, we showed you a picture of that. Be a lot of people down there. Uh, and uh, apparently it didn't, didn't take much, uh, as we'll see in some of these other cities, to get up a crowd uh, really, really going, you know, and get people upset about things, and we got to do something uh, about this. I, I think I could have done that the other day in Costco. We were, we were, uh, we went to see uh, the uh, new Denise and Susan movie, which is very good, America, excellent film. Uh, at Dole, and we're kind of oblivious to all this. We parked, you know, the Costco side, and we're going to go into Costco. We walk in, and it's, man, it's a madhouse, and you can hardly get a cart. There's people everywhere. And there's pallets everywhere they can stack them of water <coughs> bottles. And, uh, and people are just like, you know, ferociously grabbing these water bottles and stacking. And then they're running out and they're running to the next, you know, stack. And, and uh, you, can see, you can see this like frenzy, you know, that's kind of beginning. To, I didn't understand because I had water at home. So I, I didn't understand the attraction there. You know, I was just going to go home and fill some containers up. But anyway, they, these folks had to have water bottles. And uh, for whatever reason, it would have been easy to cause a riot. Where's the water? We want more water. If there were some people that grew up in the 60s, see, they would have been right in there with me. I could have had chanting. We could have you know, had a little riot right there in Costco. We could have just grabbed them and run out. You know, We shouldn't have to pay for this. It's our right. Everybody should get water. This should be free. How many of you are with me? I, I, I'm really not that tight. But uh, <clears throat> that's what's going on. Uh, it's interesting. Our text calls them evil men. New American Standard calls them wicked men. I like the King James, lewd fellows of the baser sort. That's a great, great little phrase. But I want to remember that. You could say that to someone, they wouldn't even know you're insulting them. <laughs> the great Greek scholar, A.T. Robinson, he translates them as bums. That's his term for them. So there's this uh, whole assault on Jason's house. Paul and 
and Silas. They've already got them uh, out of there apparently in the night. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the accusations uh, that they've turned the world uh, upside down. And, and really the accusation is twofold. Uh, we would say that the world is upside down because of the fall. Uh, you could watch your TV tonight, watch the Middle East burning, uh, watch a, a group called ISIS who is going through Iraq uh, because you will not agree with their religious fervor uh, and their view of Islam. They're beheading children uh, and all kinds of atrocities are, are taking place. Some of them are actually uh, on, uh, on YouTube and so forth. Barbarian kinds of things. I would say the world is upside down. These men were trying to turn it right side up uh, and, uh, and bring uh, uh, people into faith with Jesus Christ to have a relationship with their creator so God's grace and peace could be shed upon men, which is only possible through a relationship with him. So I think they have the, that part of the accusation uh, a little backwards. The other one is the same argument used at the trial of Jesus, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And the, the Greek here means another of another kind. Yeah, there is Caesar. They're saying there is another king of another completely kind in terms of Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting if you go back and read First and Second Thessalonians, Paul makes a real point of the kingship of, of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, and apparently that's part of what they're hearing uh, in the synagogue as he's ministering there uh, the last couple of weeks. <clears throat> the reason this is an issue within the Roman Empire is because in 30 AD, the emperor at that time, a man named Octavius, changes his name with the, uh, a little uh, urging from some of his friends uh, to Augustus Caesar. He takes the title Pontifus Maximus, uh, which means the number one god. Again, in Rome, uh, religion was legal. You could worship Apollo, and you could worship uh, uh, the trees and the bushes and the stars. It didn't really matter. Uh, but when it came down to it, push came to shove, you better willing to burn your incense once a year and say, Caesar is Lord. He is the number one God. Uh, you can see why for the pantheist, the polytheistic people of that uh, era, not an issue, not a problem. You can see there'd be a little bit of a problem if you're Jewish. Uh, it would be a little bit of a problem uh, if you're a Christian. Uh, and that's what they're saying. What these guys are committing here is treason because they're saying there is another king of another kind greater than Caesar himself. So that's their, uh, their leverage against these city uh, officials. Uh, the way it all kind of pans out here and the reason they're able to walk away, we'd say lastly, uh, is because the settlement here in court uh, included Paul being forbidden to come to the city uh, ever again. That's in verse 9. It's a little cryptic there. It's the little phrase. So when they had taken security, taken security, that means Jason and the others posted some money in a promissory note <coughs> saying Paul would not enter the city of Thessalonica again. And, uh, and so uh, he, he can't go there personally, but he can send Timothy, he can send Silas, uh, he can send others that uh, he's trained up in the ministry. Uh, but apparently, and we'll read a little passage in a moment there, he refers to this idea of, uh, man, I wish I could come to you guys, but I can't do it. Satan is hindering me. Uh, and this promissory note here uh, has a lot to do with that. So again, the apologetics of Paul and Thessalonica, uh, it's, um, uh, we can learn the principles of, of, that Paul uses in sharing his faith. Uh, there's the assault, the pushback uh, as a result of it. Uh, and again, going to that letter, 1 Thessalonians, uh, Paul says this in verse 17 of chapter 2. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more <clears throat> eagerly to see your face with a great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan is hindered us. He wasn't able to, uh, to get back there uh, again, apparently. Uh, and again, the uh, sentiment of Paul wanting to see them and so forth, uh, this is the church that basically he's able to brag about uh, because they are all out there. Share, they become famous for sharing their faith all over that Roman province. Well, he moves on now to, to Berea, verses 10 to 15. And we're saying that there's a unique aspect to the ministry there may be one that you're familiar with here in verse 11. But verse 10 says, uh, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. 
When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Uh, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, uh, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea. Both Paul, Silas, and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, uh, they uh, departed. So another, uh, another uh, the buses weren't running that day either. So another 45 miles down to, uh, uh, down to uh, this area of Berea. Uh, and again, the unique aspect involved the, the character of the people there themselves. Verse 11, they were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all uh, readiness. So some translations, uh, more noble. So uh, they were more uh, uh, fair-minded is probably a, a good term. Uh, uh, in the 60s, we, we used to like to say that we were open-minded. But I can tell you based on experience, if you have an open mind, eventually it's full of a lot of junk. <laughs> Fair-minded is probably a better, discerning uh, is probably a, a better way to look at things. And they were willing to uh, allow Paul to examine the scriptures. They were willing to, uh, they were fair about what, uh, what he had to say. And then they received the word with all readiness. Readiness means eagerness. Here's the idea of rushing forward. Uh, in a sense, it's like, man, somebody is bringing us the truth of God's word and they couldn't wait uh, to hear it, to receive it. And it should be that way with all believers. We should all be eager to hear, to hear the word of God. Said of George Mueller that he read the Bible over 200 times. No wonder God used him so tremendously. And, and again, that is somebody that Pastor Chuck modeled his life after. You know, the whole like, phrase of where God guides, God provides that you saw from Pastor Chuck. That comes right from George Mueller who built all kinds of orphanages in England, did tremendous works of mercy up there in the inner cities without a dime in his pocket, uh, just trusting the Lord because where God guides, uh, God would provide. But again, uh, in the word, studying the word, eager to hear the word like the Bereans here. And, and I have to say that uh, a, as a believer, when, we, when I first came to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, I, I wanted to know everything that was in the Bible. Uh, if, if God had loved me so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for me, if he has kept me from going to hell for all eternity, and he's written a document that is actually in my language that I could read, I wasn't a very good reader, and I had to turn to a dictionary periodically, uh, but I could read it and actually hear from God and hear God's word. And here is it. I just couldn't get over it. I was so excited about it. And, uh, and I think that's the, the eagerness here. I think that's what all believers should have, uh, but I think we've kind of somehow lost it, at least uh, culturally. Uh, but I think the Lord for, uh, for Calvary Chapels, which at least as a movement, is still placing a high emphasis upon the teaching of God's Word. Uh, so important that we're eager, rushing forward to it. Second aspect involved their diligence to search the Scriptures daily. Uh, again, apparently they're meeting every day. They're searching the scriptures. They are the fair-minded ones. Uh, and so they're listening to Paul. They're not just like, well, whatever he says has got to be true because he's the guy up front. Well, he's got a degree from Jerusalem. Uh, just, you know, forget it, George. If he says Jesus is the Messiah, he must be the Messiah. That's not what they're doing. Uh, they're listening to him and going, maybe, maybe. What does the Bible say? Well, that's, that's what the Bible says. Uh, and they're, they're comparing what he says. Hey, that's not a bad idea, is it? <laughs> uh, every person we listen to, including me, uh, we're to listen and then compare uh, with the scriptures. Uh, what do the scriptures say? Well, that's why I say often I'm, I'm, not a, I'm doing my best to not be pulling a rabbit out of a hat. You know, the magician, it's like he pulls a rabbit out. It's like, wow, where did that come from? Uh, there, there's some preachers that are like that. Uh, they got their Bibles in it's like, uh, where did that come from? I don't think that's really in the Bible. Uh, you know, and that's why there's a constant. I, I do my best to say, notice verse 7. Uh, notice verse 8. We're trying to just open up the scriptures. And they do pretty good speaking for themselves. Uh, and just and hear what they, they have to say. Uh, but that's what we're all supposed to be doing. One writer said, 
Acceptance of teaching without discernment is not a Christian value. That's not a Christian value. Christians are the thinkers uh, uh, historically. Uh, and these men and women were here. Uh, verse 12, therefore many of them believed. And also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. So searching the scriptures, prompted by the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit using God's holy word uh, brought men and women in faith, the faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, and so again, uh, two different settings, uh, but Paul again uh, reasoning, uh, sincere about sharing his faith, very effective in doing so. And then this closing verse is uh, easy to read through and kind of miss what's uh, what's being said here in verse 14. It says then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, uh, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command for uh, Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So basically, uh, they realized there's a mob in the marketplace uh, down there, the bums. Uh, and so therefore, they grab Paul and Silas. They get them down. To, uh, remember that picture of the ancient wall going down? They get them down to, uh, to the sea. Uh, and, uh, and they give them a nice lay. Uh, and they kind of give them the shaka sign as they're sailing off into the sunset. No, they don't do that, actually. They actually get on the boat with them, sailing against the prevailing winds. We talked about that before. It wasn't an easy journey. Uh, and, they, and they head off to, uh, to Athens with them. And they deliver them on the shores and say, okay, you guys are good to go now. God bless you. And they got on the boat and went all the way back. I just thought that was kind of sweet that these guys would be like, hey, man, we're going to take care of these guys. These guys brought us the word of God. Uh, their lives are threatened. Let's just make sure they get there. And, uh, and again, it's, um, it's interesting to, to have the knowledge that, that Paul probably was never able to get back there with these guys again and then go back and, and read First Thessalonians. Uh, you know, that he writes very shortly after this, uh, this incident. And you'll see his heart for the people and his need to see uh, their hearts uh, for him. But again, just uh, principles from Paul's uh, letters here uh, on evangelism. Uh, people knew he was the real deal. They knew what kind of men we were. Uh, he was able to say, imitate me even as I imitate Jesus Christ. Um, if you're not able to do that, then repent. <laughs> Pray and ask God to, uh, you know, do that uh, good work in your life that uh, you would truly reflect uh, Jesus Christ uh, to others. Uh, That's pretty foundational if we're going to be effective uh, in sharing uh, sharing the gospel. Uh, again, sometimes it's going to be with much affliction. It's not always going to be easy. Some people are going to receive the Lord. Uh, others are going to give you a hard time. Some people are going to kind of, well, that's good for you, but it's not good for me, and they're going to kind of give you their... Uh, their little uh, New Age cycle Bible, uh, Bible thing about it or whatever. That's what I get a lot. Uh, it's good for you. It's not good for me. No, actually, it's good for everybody. But uh, uh, we then need to reason with them from the scriptures and say, you know, that's not quite good enough. Actually, uh, this is what the situation is. Either you're right and I'm wrong or I'm wrong and you're right, but we both can't be right. There can't be many lead, roads that lead to God because they're all contradictory to each other. Uh, only one of us can be right. I believe I'm right, and I've actually got some reasons for it. What are you basing your belief system on? Uh, again, that's a dialogue. It's a little argumentative a little bit, but that's, those are honest questions to, uh, to ask. Paul was willing to do that. If it's not important to us, it won't be important to them. He explained the scriptures. Uh, again, he was able to lay out verses and then help people connect the dots to who Jesus is. Uh, and of course, then in the end, uh, demonstrating, uh, laying before them the scriptures, proving the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Does it sound like hard work to lead somebody to the Lord? Uh, it, it is, really, isn't it? But uh, I can tell you there's nothing better. There is nothing more exciting uh, to get then to get to pray with somebody to, to receive the Lord. It's certainly a plus if it's a, if it's a you know family member and somebody you've been praying with for a very long time. But it, it doesn't matter if it's uh, uh, the guy in the grocery store or the guy that cuts your hair or whatever it is that you hardly know. Uh, it's still pretty pretty exciting stuff. Uh, and uh, this is what life is meant to be. This is the adventures uh, for uh, for Christians and Christianity to come to faith in Christ. 
uh, and then to make him known to others. And uh, apparently Paul was pretty good at it. So whatever we can learn from him, yeah, that's, that's, that's a plus. Amen? Well, Acts 17, Athens next week. The only message preached to a bunch of Gentiles. There's some very interesting things. If you read through that, in the way Paul, and it'll be, be very helpful to us, the way Paul addresses uh, that group in uh, Athens there at the area of So uh, that's next week. Out of the wreckage, shot from down in the deepest dark, a rising fire and light. You can rush it like the wind and burn it like a flame to fill the night. Yeah. Mm-hmm.
the truth that 